representing more than $10 billion in business. Shotwell is a member of the SpaceX Board of Directors. Prior to joining SpaceX, Shotwell spent more than 10 years at the Aerospace Corporation, holding positions in space systems engineering, technology, and project management. She was promoted to the role of chief engineer of an MLV class satellite program, managed a landmark study at the Federal Aviation Administration on commercial space transportation, and completed an extensive analysis of space policy for NASA's future investment in space transportation. In addition to being named the 2018 Satellite Executive of the Year, Shotwell was awarded the AIAA Goddard Astronautics Awards, as well as the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Ralph Coates Rowe Medal. Fortune Magazine placed Shotwell at number 42 on their list of the world's 50 greatest leaders in 2018, and Forbes named her number 70 on their list of power women in 2017. In 2014, Shotwell was appointed to the United States Export Import Bank's Advisory Committee and the Federal Aviation Administration's Management Advisory Council. Shotwell was elected to the honorable grade of fellow with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Through leadership in both corporate and external science, technology, engineering, and math STEM programs, Shotwell has helped raise over $1.8 million for STEM programs reaching thousands of students nationwide. Shotwell received with honors her bachelor's and master's degrees from Northwestern University in Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mathematics and serves on their board. She has authored dozens of papers on a variety of space-related subjects. So Gwen, this is an amazing background and you do a lot to advance our space industry and um, really just an honor to have you here today. Thank you very much. Just president would have been fine, but. Uh... <laughs> no, this is well earned, so. <laughs> Thank you very um, much for the intro. Sure. So um, we'll start with our first question today from Mariam Nassim. Um, and she asks, what made you join SpaceX back in the day? And what is the most exciting aspect of your role today? So I'll answer the second part first. Um, the, the best part about my job, if, if not the most exciting part for sure, is to work with uh, the extraordinary folks uh, at SpaceX. Uh, I think we're close to 9,000 people right now. Um, and they all work incredibly hard. They're really smart. It's really a joy to be around them. So that's the best part of my job. So we'll call that the most exciting part. Launch is pretty exciting as well, but it's kind of nerve wracking. Uh, and as far as how I joined or why I decided to join SpaceX, it's uh, um, Elon asked me to, to join as head of his sales team, basically. Um, and I wasn't sure initially. Uh, I wasn't looking for a job, but I was like, oh, should I? should I do this? I don't know. Is he really going to make it work? And then in the end, I really, I said to myself, look, I'd been in the industry already for 15 years and I found it to be very slow moving, not particularly innovative. And I thought, you know what, this will be my last job in the aerospace industry. If Elon can't make SpaceX work, then I'll go be a barista or sell real estate or do anything other than work in this sludgy, boring uh, industry. Uh, so that was 18 years ago, by the way, uh, and things, this industry has come a long way in that, in that time frame for sure. Yeah, and you've taken the company to great bounds, so <laughs> that's amazing. Um, okay, so the next one we have is from Dennis Dobb, and he asks, what is the greatest challenge in making Starship and super heavy work uh, from an engineering and business point of view? So the technical details are really owned by Elon at this point on that particular project. Um, but I do know that, like, we know how to make rockets. It's not a question of making rockets work. Uh, mm -hmm. it, what it is going to be a question is Starship will be successful if we can build, men or at least it will be successful for our purpose, and that is to build a settlement on other planets. In order to do that, you can't take one ship a week or a couple of ships a month, you've got to really fly hundreds, hundreds a week, if not dozens a day. Um, and so what we really need is a production system. And though I think Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy are great rockets, it's actually quite difficult to produce them. Um, and so we need to have a great production system that can produce starships and super heavies 
so that we have hundreds a week or more to be able to fly. So the hard part is really designing a rocket that can be produced and the production system associated with producing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Ben Gamble. Um, firstly, he is um, a, a great fan of yours and <laughs> he has never missed a, um, a live launch. So he's, he's, he finds you very, very inspiring. And this is his question, he says, Whilst the technical capability, sorry, while the technical capability of Starlink is clearly needed to keep up with the Earth's exponentially increasing internet requirements and is also a fundamental communication requirement for future human life on other planetary bodies, I am slightly concerned that there was no real discussion about the implications of putting 10,000s of satellites in LEO by SpaceX or any private company. Although it was approved by the FCC, doesn't something that will change the Earth's night sky forever need a global approval, not only an American one? What are your thoughts around the moralistic considerations related to Starlink and protecting Earth's night sky for future generations? So um, we, I, I don't wanna say we didn't consider the impact. I don't think we fully understood the impact of uh, satellites in the night sky. Um, we believed once they were on orbit, they would not really produce much um, obfuscation. Uh, but what we found is while they were in transit, going to their ultimate operational orbit, they're quite bright. I mean, I think they're beautiful to look at as well, but they do change, um, they obviously do change the night sky. So we're working, um, and it'll be iterative. We've got sunshades on them right now. Um, and we'll continue to work on that particular part of, um, of deploying the Starlink constellation to make sure that it, that it is less obtrusive in the night sky than it is. Um, as far as ten, you know, tens of thousands of satellites, if you were to think about tens of thousands of people sitting on the surface of the earth, that wouldn't be a lot of people, right? You, it, it wouldn't seem like a lot of people, and yet it would be, it's even more sparse as you increase the altitude, right? Because the, uh, the area increases pretty dramatically. So um, it, it's a lot of satellites compared to existing quantities of satellites, but it doesn't really seem like a lot of satellites when you put it in that kind of perspective. Um, but uh, regardless, there is not another company uh, doing this kind of work that is more focused on ensuring that uh, the space environment is not cluttered. It would not be in our best interest to have the space environment be cluttered. It would also not be in our best interest to have um, uh, young people or have an impact to astronomy uh, in any way. In fact, I just chatted with a college student yesterday and she became it, she's a, a studying astrophysics and she became interested in, uh, in this technical career because of her time um, going to summer camp and being in a place where she had a great view of the sky, the night sky and the stars. So there's no way that we're gonna wanna hurt that in any way. Um, so um, we'll continue to work, we'll stumble and we'll make mistakes, but we will continue to do the right thing in this, uh, in this field, in this regard. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to keep that moral viewpoint as well. So that's great to hear. Um, two follow on questions related to Starlink, actually. This is from Mina Tekla. He asks, does SpaceX have plans to service satellite, Starlink satellites and how would that work? Oh, service the satellites on orbit. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, we don't uh, we don't have a plan currently. Um, the way we, we, these satellites aren't particularly expensive. They're not like, though they're very capable, uh, we figured out a way to uh, build and deploy them at quite low cost comparatively. So I don't know that they'd be worth servicing. Um, an important feature of a Starlink satellite, however, is it can maneuver to get out of the way, again, to avoid this space debris situation. Um, if we were to have a satellite uh, that was going to be troublesome, what I would love to do is think about using the Starship capability to go pick up the space debris. And I know that's really hard and it's very much kind of a futuristic concept, uh, but, uh, but I definitely think that that's something worth uh, pursuing. So we wouldn't service the satellite, but it would be great to go up and grab it and, and, okay. and bring it back. 
if necessary. Otherwise, they come down. They're, they're, right now, they're, they're in a pretty low altitude. We brought them down from the much higher altitude where we originally um, designed the constellation. And it was almost singularly because we wanted to make sure that they would uh, re-enter and demise much more quickly. Absolutely. So um, uh, the long answer, now the shorter answer is, I'm not sure they're worth servicing other than getting them <laughs> up to order. Gotcha. Um, so this one's also related, um, and this is about um, the markets that the Starlink satellites might service. So Starlink has, uh, this is from Brennan Bach. Um, Starlink has the potential to radically change global connectivity beyond rural internet users. What other markets are you hoping Starlink will penetrate? Are there any future government or commercial applications made possible through Starlink you are particularly excited for? So that's interesting as far as new markets, what we for sure want to do is make sure we can serve those that are underserved and those that are completely unserved to start. Um, you know, we have beams that uh, don't care whether they're over cities or over the country. So the beams don't care where the markets are, they are where they are. Um, and we'd like to make sure that we leverage that people can use those beams uh, anywhere on the globe. Um, so for sure, um, direct to consumer has always been our primary play, basically um, home-based broadband. Um, there will be enterprise or business uses uh, for this system as well. I mean, if it's great capability, why wouldn't uh, companies use that capability as well? Um, we are very interested in um, um, providing service on aircraft. Um, I, I don't know how many times I wanna throw my laptop or throw my phone in an airplane when I, sign up with GoGo -Go and uh, the service sucks and I just get really mad knowing I'm just gonna have to go fight to get my money back, get a reimbursement. Um, so th that's a market for sure we're that we wanna do. At some point, we probably will consider community Wi-Fi, although that's a little complicated and we'll, that will be, that'll be later. Really what we wanna do now is really just focus on building out the constellation and making sure that the service and the network that we provide uh, are, is good enough for people to want to use it. Sure. And then and that, worry, worry about the business later, actually. Yeah, absolutely. And that airplane analogy is very relatable. So, yeah. um, all right. So this next one is from Shana Hume. Um, how do you address the intense burnout that comes from working so ambitiously towards an interplanetary goal? You know, I think big, uh, big ambitious or, or absurdly ambitious, ambitious goals are the way to prevent burnout, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you work to something that's really great, um, towards something that's really great and really important. And I think that kind of makes, makes it easier to work long and hard. I think it, work isn't work if you're passionate about what you're doing, really. It's, uh, I think careers are more of a journey than they are work, or they, I think in the best case, they certainly are. Um, so yeah, I think absurdly ambitious goals are helpful to prevent burnout. Day-to-day uh, -day is different. Uh, people at SpaceX work incredibly hard, but um, I think we've learned over time um, what people can sustain and, and what is not sustainable. And I think we've got uh, a little bit more I think management is a little bit more aware of ensuring and watching for burnout, especially when you're launching so many, so many times uh, a year, this will be our biggest year, knock on wood. Um, and, uh, and you want to make sure you don't screw that up. Uh, the cause they can't, you know, if you have someone that's exhausted and doing something to the rocket that they shouldn't be doing or making a mistake. And for some reason we don't catch it. Um, you know, that's, that's not a great situation, especially when you're carrying people. Yeah. I like that positive outlook. Um, all right, so our next one is from Brendan Russo. He asks, what recommendations, and this is relevant for what we, uh, what's happening in our time today, what recommendations would you make for the next administration? What would you like to see change and or stay the same? Thanks, Gwen. <laughs> so I do really love the, um, the, the, the absurdly ambitious goal of putting uh, a woman on the moon in 2024. Um, I know that particular thrust was criticized. It seems impossible, but yet again, I think that's kind of what SpaceX is all about. We set out these crazy goals. We usually fall short a little bit time-wise. We don't get there as fast as we want, but we almost always get there. 
Um, so I would for sure continue to promote um, putting people back on the moon and as quickly as we can do it. Um, if the current administration stays, then uh, they might double down on 2024. Um, if a new administration comes in, you know, hopefully they continue to, to think hard about doing important things um, rapidly. Not important things decades from now, but important things rapidly. Um, you'd mentioned um, putting a woman on the moon. So this one's relevant to that comment. Um, it's from Anonymous. I think we can all agree that you are a trailblazer and are an example to aspiring leaders everywhere. Being a woman, you are also a minority in this level of leadership um, and are a role model. Do you mind sharing your thoughts on what it is like to pave the way for other women? You know, it's interesting. I never thought of myself um, as a role model until relatively recently, the last few years. Um, I tend to not like being uh, in the in the media spotlight. I I'm perfectly happy for others at the company to go do those jobs. It is not my favorite thing to do. Um, and then um, and I had won some award, and I was you know I don't want to. I don't want to accept this award. I don't want to go, whatever. And one of the women in at the company, just kind of over next door at the propulsion on the propulsion team said, no, this is really important. Like you go out there and you, you accept the award and get out there and, and, and show that, uh, uh, that uh, women uh, can do anything. So um, it was kind of that punch in the face where um, I still don't love doing media interviews, by the way. Um, but, uh, but I did uh, come to better understand that these things are really important. Important for the company, for sure, but uh, really important for some of the individuals at the company. Um, and by the way, I became an engineer because of a role model. Um, well, sort of a role model, kind of a very temporary and transient role model. Um, my mother was uh, quite artistic and my father was a, a neurosurgeon. Um, I had no engineering I didn't know when, when an engineer did. In fact, like growing up, you know what an engineer drives a train, right? That's what engineers do when you're little. Um, but I met a women, an engineer at uh, a Society of Women Engineers event and I loved her. I thought I loved what she was doing and she was super stylish. And so she was the reason why I decided to become an engineer. Um, and it was only kind of when I reacquainted myself, I think it was actually during an interview when someone said, why did you become an engineer? And I explained, I told the story and recognized, duh, you know, she was a role model for me to be an engineer. So we need more role models for women to be engineers. Absolutely. Um, all right. So the next one is from Shana Hume again. Uh, what is your personal moonshot within the overall mission of SpaceX? Oh, that's interesting. I don't think we are going to achieve my moonshot, but uh, I am passionate about space transportation. Not to, I mean, the moon is cool. I love the moon. I would love to go. Mars, not sure I'm gonna go, but I'm super supportive of settling uh, or of moving humans, uh, human life there. But I really would love to figure out a way to um, build space transportation capabilities that can take us much further, much further faster. I would love to meet other, I'll say people, but I don't, you know, whatever they call themselves. I, that would be, that would be, that's why I do what I do actually. That's the coolest part is I that's feel awesome. like we're at like the very beginning of making that happen. Like the very beginning, mm -hmm. very, very beginning. <laughs> and like, and I don't think we'll get there. I, we, I don't think we'll get there in my lifetime, but it'd be great. You never know. <laughs> so I guess this next one kind of builds into that. If you build it, and this is from Tasman Powers, if you build it, they will come. Can the same be said for transport to Mars? How do you make a business case for moving to a new and unforgiving world? You know, um, people surprise, people will always surprise you. Uh, and there are a lot of people, there are actually a lot of people that want to go to Mars. Um, and I don't want to shoot myself and my business uh, in the foot by saying, I don't want to go to Mars, but I don't think I'm the best person to go to Mars. But there are a lot of people that do want to go. In fact, many SpaceXers a pretty substantial percentage of SpaceX employees want to go to Mars. So it can't be that odd. I'm sure there are millions or a few million people that want to go. I'm, I'm sure of it. 
Um, and as far as the market goes, you know, I, we're not really doing this for that. Um, I, I do believe that, that space as an enterprise will grow dramatically when people are out and about, frankly, in space. Um, but, uh, but actually just building Starship to deploy satellites like Starlink, constellations like Starlink makes, makes sense financially to go get Starship to go work. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is from Sian O'Regan. Have SpaceX started any sort of development into making spacesuits for Moon or Mars EVA? If so, is it going to be made in-house like Crew Dragon suits? I'm pretty sure we'll make our own suits. And I have heard some of the suit uh, engineers talk about different environments. Um, but we don't have, I've not seen a prototype and I've not even seen a rendition yet of what the suit would look like for uh, like an EVA, basically an outside the spaceship suit. I haven't seen one yet, but okay. I know they're thinking about it. Yeah, it's in the works. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is from Mina Tekla. Um, he's interested in understanding what is this expected Starship launch cost per kilogram to Leo? Um, and to the lunar surface in 2024? Um, we're still competing. So I'm not gonna talk about prices to the moon. Um, as far as launches per, launch cost per kilogram, we do want Starship. I mean, ultimately we'd love for the cost of a Starship mission to be the fuel cost and whatever operations you know, are wrapped around that. So, mm -hmm. you know, a few million dollars um, per mission. Um, but we won't be there for a while, for quite some time, but that certainly is kind of the physics-based lowest cost that we could get to. Or, um, you know, really, I think a great goal would be to um, have Starship delivery capability at Falcon 9 prices, you know, in the $50 million range. I think that would be, I think that would be great. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Um, this is again thinking about the future vision of SpaceX from Sarah. Um, Europa has shown possible chances of life and we are still learning about it each day. Has SpaceX shown interest in working towards Europa as a potential after we reach Mars? Uh, you know, the only discussion we've had about Europa is, uh, is possibly being able to launch the, the project um, that, uh, that's, uh, that's under development right now. Um, we've been very focused, kind of heads down, and, and maybe we can be criticized for that at the moment, but really focused on building the ship itself, um, hoping that once we show great progress, then the others will pop up and start solving those, the other problems associated with living on other planets. Um, Cause there's a lot of work that needs to get done, not just getting people there, um, but they need to be protected once they're there. We need to figure out healthcare once we're there. We need to figure out how is their health impacted by being there. There's so much to do. Um, and, and I think we're hoping that others kind of pick up and, and, and join in. And I think there, I think there are obviously people that are worried, working that, in, I mean, NASA is working on it as well. Um, so uh, kind of getting back to your question, I don't think we've looked specifically at Europa. Um, the only context we've been looking just at least currently at Europa is launching the, the spacecraft, but it's super interesting. I mean, there's so many interesting things um, in space, so many interesting things to go explore. Absolutely. And speaking about cargo versus human um, missions, um, SpaceX started with cargo, and then now you've transitioned to the human aspect, uh, reviving, helping reviving human spaceflight. So how have you had to prepare differently for going from cargo to, say, uh, human um, transportation? Um, have you had to take extra safety precautions, uh, measures? How has that kind of grown over time. So there's no question that focusing on cargo initially with the technology was incredibly helpful to the company. So I do like that progression of cargo first, then people. Um, in fact, Starship will, I think, initially carry cargo to the moon um, before, we put, uh, before we put people on the surface. Um, I think it's really important that you understand your technology and you know, understand how to operate it. Um, and so doing it in a way where, you know, it's obviously unfortunate anytime you have a mission failure, but 
the stakes are so different when there's people involved versus uh, versus cargo. You know, even exquisite satellites that are in the billion range, that's still having a failure there is still way better than than um, when there's people involved. Um, and there's no question that uh, we learned quite a bit in the in the commercial crew program. Um, the, the important big development for us was the escape system on Dragon. So even if you were to have a really crappy day with Falcon 9, if something were to go wrong with Falcon 9, the capsule would be able to leave the vehicle and either uh, escape to orbit or escape to, uh, to ocean. Um, so that was the biggest development that we had, but the, I think the whole company changed a little bit. Um, the stakes are much higher at the company, not just because of people, but that certainly that has a huge, um, have, is a huge driver for us for, to focus on reliability. We just have a lot of missions to execute for customers um, and, uh, and we don't wanna let them down. Absolutely. Um, we're nearing our time, but I'd like to ask maybe one or two more questions. Um, I'm going to combine two from one from MG Kalne and Surya Vohra. Um, it's about what advice you might give to young women in the industry who want to build their professional capacities to one day take on management or leadership roles. And then the one from Surya Vohra is about what advice would you have for someone who wants to fill your shoes one day? So basically, how do we work up to do what you do? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I think I have been success. I mean, you'd have to ask people that work with me, but I think I have been successful or, or Elon asked me to be president because I was always willing to take on new scope. You know, if I started as head of sales, right. But as soon as you have a customer, you've got customers. Now you've got to manage a customer. So I managed, I became mission manager and then we have to actually launch them. So I needed to arrange, uh, basically generate a bunch of the paperwork associated with the ranges and getting cited on these federal ranges. Um, and then when you have customers, you have money. And so then there's a finance function. And I, so I kind of helped manage finance function. And then we started seeing some success. So then our detractors and our competitors started fighting us on the hill. So then we need to have a government affairs, affairs function. And so I kind of took on that. So I think it's being willing to stretch yourself and take on new roles. And by the way, you will always feel uncomfortable. Uh, you will always feel uncomfortable taking on new roles and women tend to really underestimate their ability to succeed in roles where they have no, a little or no experience. But if you're smart and if you listen to people and if you work hard, you will be successful. I am sure of it. And there are lots of people, there are many people that, that are far smarter than me, that are better than me, that I want to come take film, film my shoes at SpaceX, <laughs> right? Because we have to do better all the time. So uh, yeah, so work hard, listen hard to people around you, listen hard to the people that work for you and the people that you work for, do great work um, and, and try to be fearless or at least don't hold yourself back from taking a role that you don't feel very comfortable stepping into because you'll just do great anyhow. And you're setting a great example for all of us, not just women, men as well yes. <laughs> and, yes. and the whole world. So yeah. um, I think I'd like to end on this last question. Um, you've been recently named Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Uh, what does this designation mean to you? And what do you look forward to influencing most via this well-earned privilege that accompanies this title? You know, so it's interesting. Um, this was another one of those situations where um, I was not super comfortable with the award. I don't even have a social media presence. Um, I had a, a, a I, I used Facebook for a while and I had a Twitter account, but both got hacked in the same week. And I said, oh, screw it. I like shut down all my social media. Um, but what, how, the way I took that was that SpaceX is really um, influencing the way people are thinking about careers and the way that people are thinking about space and space enterprise and new kind of new businesses. Um, and so I hope that we continue because we have to keep setting the bar higher because people will get bored with just watching webcasts. I think they're fun. I think launches are still great and I love our launch videos, but we have to figure out how to do even more to get more people, engage more people in thinking about space. 
Um, I do think it's an important frontier for us to, to work. Um, yeah, so that's how I hope to leverage that platform is to get people thinking about space, more people thinking about space. I think that's great. <laughs> so um, it's been really fun talking with you, Gwen, and I'm sure all our delegates today learned a lot from you and obviously they are so inspired by you. So um, really it's an honor to have had to have had you here with us today. And uh, good luck with all the upcoming SpaceX endeavors. I know there are a few more launches coming up very soon. Be so. more this year, be more this year. Yeah. yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I appreciate you having me on. Okay, thank you very have much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Too. you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>